Legendary Passages, Episode 100, Diodorus Siculus, Library of History, Book 4, Section 56, The Birth of Theseus. The next 25 episodes cover the early adventures of Theseus, son of Aegeus. In this passage, he journeys to Athens to be recognized by his father. But first, this passage continues from last episode with an alternate route of the Argonauts around the Iberian Peninsula. Then the sons of Heracles fought wars against Eurystheus, Mycenae, Troy, and the Dorian invasion. Finally, Theseus was born to Aethra, daughter of Pythias. On the way to Athens, he slew Corinetes the clubber, Sinus the pine bender, the Cromionian sow, Skyron of Megara, Kirkian the wrestler, and Procrustes the stretcher. Once recognized, Theseus and Aegeus sacrificed the Marathonian bull, the sire of the Minotaur. The Birth of Theseus, a legendary passage from C. H. Oldfather, translating Diodorus Siculus, Library of History, Book 4. Sections 56 to 59. Not a few, both of the ancient historians and of the later ones as well, one of whom is Timaeus, say that the Argonauts, after their seizure of the fleece, learning that the mouth of the Pontus had already been blockaded by the fleet of Aetes, performed an amazing exploit which is worthy of mention. They sailed, that is to say, up the Tanaeus River as far as its sources, and at a certain place they hauled the ship over land, and following in turn another river which flows into the ocean, they sailed down it to the sea, and they made their course from the north to the west, keeping the land on the left, and when they had arrived near Gadira, Cadiz, they sailed into our sea. And the writers even offer proofs of these things, pointing out that the Celts who dwell along the ocean venerate the Dioscori above any of the gods, since they have a tradition handed down from ancient times that these gods appeared among them coming from the ocean. Moreover, the country which skirts the ocean bears, they say, not a few names which are derived from the Argonauts and the Dioscori. And likewise, the continent this side of Gadira contains visible tokens of the return voyage of the Argonauts. So, for example, as they sailed about the Tyrrhenian Sea, when they put in at an island called Athalia, they named its harbor, which is the fairest of any in those regions, Argoan, after their ship, and such has remained its name to this day. In like manner to what we have just narrated, a harbor in Utruria, 800 stades from Rome, was named by them Telamon, and also at Formia in Italy, the harbor Aetes, which is now known as Caetes. Furthermore, when they were driven by the winds to the Syrtes, and had learned from Triton, who was king of Libya at that time, of the peculiar nature of the sea there, upon escaping safe out of the peril, they presented him with a bronze tripod which was inscribed with ancient characters and stood until rather recent times among the peoples of Uhesperus. We must not leave unrefuted the account of those who state that the Argonauts sailed up the river Ister as far as its sources and then, by its arm which flows in the opposite direction, descended to the Adriatic Gulf. For time has refuted those who assumed that the Ister, which empties by several mouths into the Pontus, and the Ister, which issues into the Adriatic, flow from the same regions. As a matter of fact, 
when the Romans subdued the nation of the Istrians. It was discovered that the latter river has its sources only forty stades from the sea. But the cause of the error on the part of the historians was, they say, the identity and the name of the two rivers. Since we have sufficiently elaborated the history of the Argonauts and the deeds accomplished by Heracles, it may be appropriate also to record, in accordance with the promise we made, the deeds of his sons. Now after the deification of Heracles, his sons made their home in Trachis at the court of Saax the king. But later, when Hylas and some of the others had attained manhood, Eurystheus, being afraid lest, after they had all come of age, he might be driven from his kingdom at Mycenae, decided to send the Heraclid into exile from the whole of Greece. Consequently, he served notice upon Saax the king to banish both the Heraclid and the sons of Lysimnius, and Aeolus as well, and the band of Arcadians who had served with Heracles on his campaigns, adding that, if he should fail to do these things, he must submit to war. But the Heraclide and their friends, perceiving that they were of themselves not sufficient in number to carry on a war against Eurystheus, decided to leave Trachis of their own free will, and going about among the most important of the other cities, they asked them to receive them as fellow townsmen. When no other city had the courage to take them in, the Athenians alone of all, such being their inborn sense of justice, extended a welcome to the sons of Heracles, and they settled them and their companions in the flight, in the city of Tricorthius, which is one of the cities of what is called the Tetropolis. After some time, when all the sons of Heracles had attained to manhood, and a spirit of pride sprang up in the young men because of the glory of descent from Heracles. Eurystheus, viewing with suspicion their growing power, came up against them with a great army. But the Heraclide, who had the aid of the Athenians, chose as their leader Aeolus, the nephew of Heracles, and after entrusting to him and Theseus and Hylas the direction of the war, they defeated Eurystheus in a pitched battle. In the course of the battle, the larger part of the army of Eurystheus was slain, and Eurystheus himself, when his chariot was wrecked in the flight, was killed by Hylas, the son of Heracles. Likewise, the sons of Eurystheus perished in the battle to a man. After these events, all the Heraclid, now that they had conquered Eurystheus in a battle, whose fame was noised abroad, and were well supplied with allies because of their success, embarked upon a campaign against the Peloponnesus, with Hylas as their commander. Atreus, after the death of Eurystheus, had taken over the kingship in Mycenae, and having added to his forces the Tegeatans and certain other peoples as allies, he went forth to meet with the Heraclid. When the two armies were assembled at the Isthmus, Hylas, Heracles' son, challenged to single combat any one of the enemy who would face him, on the agreement that, if Hylas should conquer his opponent, the Heraclid should receive the kingdom of Eurystheus, but that, if Hylas were defeated, the Heraclid would not return to the Peloponnesus for a period of fifty years. Echemus the king of the Tegeatans came out to meet the challenge, and in the single combat which followed, Hylas was slain, and the Heraclid gave up, as they had promised, their effort to return, and made their way back to Trichorythus. Some time later, Lysimnius and his sons, and Tlepolemus, the son of Heracles, made their home in Argos, the Argives admitting them to citizenship of their own accord. But all the rest who had made their homes in Trichorthius, when the fifty-year period had expired, returned to the Peloponnesus. Their deeds we shall record when we have come to those times. 
Alcmene returned to Thebes, and when some time later she vanished from sight, she received divine honors at the hands of the Thebans. The rest of the Heraclide, they say, came to Aegimius, the son of Doris, and demanding back the land which their father had entrusted to him, made their home among the Dorians. But Tlepolemus, the son of Heracles, while he dealt in Argos, slew Lysimnius, the son of Electrion, we are told, in a quarrel over a certain matter, and being exiled from Argos because of this murder, changed his residence to Rhodes. The island was inhabited at that time by Greeks who had been planted there by Triopus, the son of Phorbus. Accordingly, Tlepolemus, acting with the common consent of the natives, divided Rhodes into three parts, and founded there three cities, Lindus, Iolysus, and Chimeris. And he became king over all the Rhodians because of the fame of his father Heracles, and in later times took part with Agamemnon in the war against Troy. But since we have set forth the facts concerning Heracles and his descendants, it will be appropriate in this connection to speak of Theseus, since he emulated the labors of Heracles. Theseus, then, was born of Aethra, the daughter of Pythias, and Poseidon, and was reared and chosen at the home of Pythias, his mother's father. And after he had found and taken up the tokens which, as the myths relate, had been placed by Aegeus beneath a certain rock, he came to Athens. And taking the road along the coast, as men say, since he emulated the high achievements of Heracles, he set out performing labors which would bring him both approbation and fame. The first, then, whom he slew was he who was called Corinetes, who carried a Corini, as it was called, or club, which was the weapon with which he fought. And with it killed any who passed by. And the second was Sinis, who made his home on the Isthmus. Sinis, it should be explained, used to bend over two pines, fasten one arm to each of them, and then suddenly release the pines, the result being that the bodies were pulled asunder by the force of the pines, and the unfortunate victims met a death of great vengeance. For his third deed, he slew the wild sow, which had its haunts about Cromion, a beast which excelled in both ferocity and size, and was killing many human beings. Then he punished Skyron, who made his home in the rocks of Megaris, which are called after him the Skyronian rocks. This man, namely, made it his practice to compel those who passed by to wash his feet at a precipitous place, and then, suddenly giving them a kick, he would roll them down the crags into the sea at a place called Kelony, Turtle. At near Lysis he slew Kirkian, who wrestled with those who passed by and killed whomever he could defeat. After this he put to death Procrustes, as he was called, who dwelt in what was known as Corydalus in Attica. This man compelled the travelers who passed by to lie down upon a bed, and if any were too long for the bed, he cut off the parts of their body which protruded, while in the case of such as were too short for it, he stretched their legs, this being the reason why he was given the name Procrustes. After successfully accomplishing the deeds which we have mentioned, Theseus came to Athens, and by means of the tokens caused Aegeus to recognize him. Then he grappled with the Marathonian bull, which Heracles, in the performance of one of his labors, had brought from Crete to the Peloponnesus, and mastering the animal he brought it to Athens. This bull Aegeus received from him, and sacrificed to Apollo. This passage continues with the kingship of Theseus, but our next episode revisits Medea and Aegeus.